What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD interview. Every single week, we interview top entrepreneurs and just straight up top badasses. You guys out there dominating their space. These are people that are doing big things with this life. that are choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out there and create massive opportunity for themselves and for their family. So today, we got a special guest, you guys. Something I'm really excited to have on that. I think you're going to get a lot of value out of this guy's doing a lot of massive things. Entrepreneur, um, also speaker. Uh, I mean, this guy's got so much going on. So really stoked and honored to have Dave. David Cicerelli on the show. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thanks so much, Joshua. Appreciate being here. Yeah, no, I'm excited to have you. You know, I know today you're doing a lot. You know, you do a lot of different voiceovers for, for video, mm -hmm. for audiobooks. We have a lot of authors that are here, you know, that, that are always looking into those spaces. So um, you're doing a lot. I'm really excited to get into what you're doing today. But first, man, I'm always interested to hear the journey of our guests. Like, how did this whole entrepreneurship journey begin? Wind the clock to where that's, you know, junior high, high school, college. Like, how did this all start for you? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, like most uh, people, I think there's always this kind of debate of like, you know, are entrepreneurs born or made? And probably the right answer is a little bit of both, right? I mean, there's always a little bit of a spark, uh, if you will, from when you're a kid. Um, for me, I collected and uh, bought and sold a lot of hockey cards and uh, being kind of up here in Canada, that was the big thing. Uh, you know, rented out like a t card table at a, a, an expo once a year, whatever they came through. And that's where I learned the basic skills of, of buying and selling. Um, kind of being promotional. I was the only kid out of all my friends who were like, hey, yeah, I'll put them 10 bucks for a table, um, you know, to, to, and, and then kind of became the, you know, the star of the show uh, to a degree. Uh, in school, uh, I realized um, that people like to drink pop and they didn't sell pop. There was no in our school. So uh, I hustled up to the 7-Eleven, the, the corner store, and uh, actually filled my locker up with, uh, you know, Coke, Pepsi, Orange Crush, uh, Ginger Ale, and I uh, sold pop for a dollar. You know, I could buy a case of like 12 for like three bucks. I could sell pop by a can for a dollar to everybody um, out of my locker. And uh, it didn't take long. I think I think probably the custodians or someone were like looking in the, you know, the garbage bins. They're like, where are all these pop cans coming from? People leaving these pop cans. Uh, eventually kind of got back to me, of course, as being uh, being the guy uh, supplying the goods, if you will, um, to, the, to the other students. But, you know, again, just realizing, hey, there's there's an opportunity there. There's a market. Uh, there's a there's a ready audience and this is something that they want. And so, you know, uh, how, how do you kind of connect that uh, that desire of, of need out there with uh, with a ready audience? Um, so I learned early on some of those skills um, that are just, you know, prime for for entrepreneurship. So, yeah, so I love it. And we, we hear a lot of this with entrepreneurs that they, they kind of had their first taste when they were young like that. And yeah. then, you know, we get kind of conditioned by society to, to follow this path of you get done, you go to college, and then and then you got to jump into the corporate role, follow this mold. Um, did, right. did you fall into that, you know, the societal path that we're all sold? Or were you always, hey, I'm done with high school and, and always stayed entrepreneur? Or did you kind of have a shift? Yeah, no, no, no. Um, you know, my, my family is uh, maybe a little bit different than most. Um, you know, I grew up, uh, you know, with, uh, you know, kind of maybe, you know, going to church, uh, playing in, a, you know, the, the band at church and so forth. Mom and dad were pretty cool that way. They're like, hey, you know, as a teenager, like, hey, you got a lot of energy, a lot of, you know, maybe anger, if you will. They're like, mom's like, I'm either buying you a punching bag or a drum kit. You pick. And I'm like, all right, I'll go with the drum kit. Um, so uh, that was kind of the, the outlet. Uh, when I and then uh, had those kind of musical uh, experiences when graduated high school, um, you know, again, kind of a non-traditional path, uh, you know, wanted to apply the music background and uh, the technology. My dad was the first guy in the whole city uh, that I saw, he ever got a laptop and a cell phone. It was like the first one I'd seen out of any of my friends, anybody knew. Um, so kind of always had that technological bug as well, too. So the arts, entertainment, music and technology, well, what kind of career path merges all of those things together? And I stumbled upon audio engineering, basically the guy behind the glass in the recording studio who's running that gear, you know, and I found a specialized school that uh, is kind of like the audio, uh, the Harvard, if you will, of audio recording engineering uh, in here in Canada. And uh, it was a one year program. So, uh, you know, brother and sister went to university and college and so forth. But I found this one year kind of a technical school, but it was very specific <clears throat> and uh, went through that program with the, the mindset, uh, honestly, that I wanted to start a recording studio, a small recording studio and uh, use that time to learn all the skills, knowing that I wasn't going to work in somebody else's studio, that I wanted to start up my own. And uh, so, yeah, it, w it was not, you know, my, my, I think my dad was, you know, frankly, pretty cool. Mom and dad both that way. 
that um, they didn't have that necessarily that plan. They're like, they knew that I was, uh, I, I maybe had other ambitions and uh, felt like, hey, if we, if, if any one of our children, you know, I've got a brother and sister are going to be kind of an entrepreneur and, you know, saw, I mean, this is like right at like 99, right? When there was a lot of technological uh, evolution and a big boom going on, you know, I think my dad in particular spotted that as an opportunity. It's like, well, look, you can go and get a business degree afterwards, four years, a hundred grand later, or you can get a, uh, and this is the, the, I remember having this conversation, or we can help you get a, a loan from a bank and buy the equipment and uh, be, in, be in business for yourself. You know, if it doesn't work out, you're going to be no worse off. You're going to, it's more of a street sense approach to business. You would have learned all of those skills one way or another. Um, so that was really how it began really with, uh, the encouragement of my folks. Um, and, uh, that first kind of loan, I think it was like 15,000 bucks, not a, not a huge, not a, nothing to sneeze at, but not a huge sum either. And just bought that equipment. And, uh, you know, day one was in business recording. We now using my skills, the audio engineering skills and recording, um, uh, you know, friends, colleagues, referrals, local bands, anybody that wanted, uh, some, some music recorded. Um, you know, I was kind of their guy. And so that, that's how it all started. Yeah, what, what a blessing to, to have that great, you know, mentorship, if you will, from your family. Cause it's, it's, uh, uh the opposite of what we see in most households, man. So that's pretty awesome. Was your father an entrepreneur? Uh, he, yeah, he worked in, he worked in financial services and, and, uh, if you know anybody in that space, I mean, they're kind of running their own shop too, you know? Um, you know, my, my dad would, uh, you know, he, he was all client relationships. So I, you know, kind of really impressed upon that. You know, you, you learn, you pick things up around the dinner table, uh, growing up, but, um, you know, he, he did his own direct mail campaigns. Um, and, uh, you know, like it had me kind of stuffing and licking envelopes. Um, fortunately we got one of those rollers, so I didn't have to lick hundreds of envelopes. Um, but I mean, did some other really novel things. He had like a, a kiosk in the mall cause he realized, Hey, that's a, it's a high traffic spot. How can you get there? Uh, you know, he did workshops at the local college. Um, and then um, we actually uh, billeted or housed some uh, students um, from uh, from China that, uh, that had come over and they were going to school locally and just kind of through the church, they were staying with us. And this guy was like a computer genius. And again, this is like mid eighties. And, uh, my, and, and uh, my dad showed him like this computer we had. And it was like a Commodore 64, like we're going way back. And uh, he built, he designed all these amazing, like this whole gr graphics, like t today it would look like a joke. But I mean, at the time it was just like, this is amazing kind of like imagery and like a ticker scrolling by. And my, my dad just put that up in the kiosk in the, in the mall and just people came over and it just kind of showed me that like, if you can do something novel and different and be in a place of high traffic, um, people will come to you and you can start conversations. Yeah, you got to have a great product or service to offer, but you can, you can certainly bring people in and catch their eye and interest and then use that as the, the launching point to have a great conversation, hopefully a fruitful business relationship for years to come afterwards. Yeah, it's powerful stuff, man. So, all right, so you've got this skill. I mean, obviously, you, you know the knowledge, you have the skill. Um, but, uh, you know, in the, and I don't know if you read the book, The E-Myth, but in The E-Myth, they talk about your in the first five years, 80% of businesses fail. And then right. year five to 10, 80% of those that made it fail. And it's not because they weren't good at their craft. You know, you're a brilliant chef, but then now you go try to open your restaurant. And there's different tactical skills that you need to obviously learn. Um, so you go out there, you've got the skill set, you get the loan, you get the equipment. What were those first few years like building that business? Because there's a lot of other things now that, that I'm sure were new to you and new challenges. What were those first few years like? For, For sure. I mean, I mean, customer acquisition is, is the first one. Um, uh, you know, had the good fortune of connecting with uh, the the university here, um, and they had an idea. Um, it was it was uh, like one of these kind of mini case studies from some business students there, um, and they're like, "Hey, I I actually opened up this. Uh, my, my apartment was an apartment in the back and the recording studio in the front, but it was on the main drag in a in our in our town." And uh, these students came in through the university for this this uh, session. They were going to give some marketing advice, and like, you've got these huge windows. Um, you know, at, at not street level with this on the second floor, but there were massive windows all on the storefront. You know, like you got to put some, you know, d decals up there, put your brand name, use it for signage of some kind. Um, so I, you know, I uh, put the website address, big brand name, and they're just like, they peel it on kind of decals. Um, and I'm again, being high, in a high traffic location, people see it. 
it, it, it encouraged them to kind of come in. But I've always recognized that you can have um, the a, a great product. You know, this this idea of like the you'll build it and they'll come. I mean, couldn't be further from the truth. Um, I think you do need to build something, but then they don't just come automatically. You got to go out and market uh, and, and do so hopefully in a way you know that is different than everyone else's. If everyone you know, it's just listing themselves in, you know, at the time it was like the yellow pages or something or putting in newspaper ads. It's like, what am I going to do that's that's different? Um, and so came up with, you know, some some ideas to do so. But customer acquisition, because really, I mean, Peter Drucker is kind of a management guru in his own right. And I mean, he, he talks about the purpose of a business is to create a customer. That's what keeps you in business. It's not for having an amazing culture. It's not for building some, you know, some web app that people use. Um, for free, they do eventually need to be paying for that. And that is what the definition of a customer is. And that's ultimately who keeps you in business uh, in a sustainable fashion. Uh, so I, I think, to, to be honest, it's the, it's the same challenge then. And the business has had a number of pivots over the years. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's the same thing that we're faced with now, um, you, know, you know, going on a decade later, uh, that it's, it, you got to be acquiring new business, new customers all the time, um, because event, some are gonna some are gonna churn out and, and leave, but you gotta replenish those. And in order to grow, you gotta be adding more on top of that. Yeah, you know, and that's why we see this roller coaster in so many businesses. Because you're out there working hard to get the business, and then now you're fulfilling that business, and you take the foot off the accelerator of acquiring new customers. And you know, we see that happen all the time. What were some of the initial obstacles that you had to overcome that kind of shocked the hell out of you? That yeah, just didn't uh, well, one was, um, I mean, I, I actually, you know, opened up the small recording studio here in London, Ontario. I mean, there's about 400,000 people, not a big metropolis by any stretch, but uh, I actually got my name in the local newspaper on my birthday of all days. And um, it turned out my, uh, who's now my wife, Stephanie, uh, she was a classically trained singer. She was in music program at the university. Um, she would sing at weddings and funerals and special events. And her mom actually saw this newspaper article and uh, suggested that uh, cut it out, literally cut it out and left it on her bed. Because you see, Stephanie was uh, looking to get a demo CD done. I think her mom was kind of secretly tired of carting her around and carpooling her to all these places and uh, doing auditions and kind of uh, tryouts, if you will. Said if you can get her mom being kind of a pretty savvy marketer, obviously in her own right, if you can get a demo CD done, you can just hand that out to people, right? And you don't have to always be in top shape. It's kind of gonna put you in best light. So her mom connected us the two um, we came down, and I think uh, one of the f most surprising things actually was that uh, one, one of my first customers. And I certainly don't ad uh, advise this necessarily to everyone. Uh, you know, you know, I end up kind of, you know, as they say, fall falling in love with, and uh, you know, marrying, and um, you know, now we have four wonderful kids. So I did not see that. But where it kind of started to get tough is that we um, realized once we had our, uh, you know, found out we we're having our, our first, we realized we needed to get out of the recording studio business. Um, and actually, uh, because Stephanie was actually kind of the one voice talent. See, I was the engineer. I was the geek being the, the, the audio engineer and she was the, she was the talent. And so she would, we would get these scripts that came in from local businesses, like a phone system recording, press one, you know, thank you for calling so-and-so press one for this, press two for customer service. Um, we would get local radio commercials. They, a lot of people wanted a female voice. So um, Stephanie, I do the recording and Stephanie would, would, would do the voiceover. Um, and when we were expecting our first child, we realized, well, this, you know, ha having musicians and doing voiceovers ourselves wasn't kind of the, the, the best way um, forward. And so we, uh, we realized we need to make a, a, an early pivot um, of getting out of the production business. And it, the only reason it worked out is because we'd actually taught ourselves how to build our own website nowadays. I mean, WordPress is like a godsend. Um, I mean, plug and play in in five minutes. You buy a premium theme from somewhere like Theme Forest, or there's a lot of great designers out there as well too. But I mean, you can put something pretty awesome up quickly. Back in that that time, uh, we literally went down to the local library, took out uh, web design for dummies, and taught ourselves like how to how to design a website from scratch. And so that actually we we'd done so. Um, and that actually acquired uh, the first couple um, corporate clients that that you know that uh, that were wanting these voiceovers. Stephanie did them, but what it also did was acquire other voice talent. It kind of brought them to this primitive brochure website, and it brought them into the fold. 
and they were looking on getting work themselves. And so they wanted to, they would say, oh, hey, I, I see you got one female voice talent. I'm a guy. I'm in New York. Can I be on your website? I do character voices and cartoons for cartoons. I do celebrity impersonations. Um, can I be on your website? I speak French. I speak Spanish. All these things. The next thing you know, we had this whiteboard in the kind of corner, uh, you know, kitchenette, if you will, in our, in our uh, condo. And uh, we start writing all these names down of the people that we were listing on our website. We're like, shoot, there's totally, again, spotting an opportunity and being willing to take that risk. And so we realized, let's step out of the production business and instead let's build this platform into a marketplace where you're connecting these two parties together, the buyers and the sellers, the clients who are looking to hire the voice actors, and then those voice actors that are looking for work. Now, again, today there's marketplaces for everything, but you know, there's a U ship where you can get anything shipped, you know, crazy stuff like a whale to a grand piano to like, you know, medical supplies and get them and people bid on that work. So there's buyers and sellers for those kind of things. Obviously travel websites, Airbnb, Uber, that's all supply and demand is what this is connecting. But rolling back 10 years, this idea of connecting buyers and sellers in effect of voiceovers was very new. And we launched with a few dozen voice talent on this platform. Um, and that's really was the big kind of first shift. I think we ran the recording studio maybe for two years or so. Um, but you can, when you spot a moment like that, timing's everything, right? And, and um, you, you got you to gotta jump on it right away or else you'll just be regretting it later. So, so the, you know, time, time, the time, time is of the essence. essence. So and, and, and when you talk about spotting the timing, you know, usually in our personal lives, the timing is never right for us, but we know it's the timing to strike, you know, so you guys uh, are... It's, it's, you know what? There's, there's never the right time to start a business. There's never a right time to get married. There's never a right time to have kids. There's never a perfect time for any of that stuff. Trust me, we have four kids, um, you know, and, 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 and we tell them this, like we didn't like kind of go about planning this. Like some people try to wait for the perfect moment in their life to plan the kids. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe we were foolish or whatnot, but, um, you know, we, we didn't plan to have any of the children at any of those particular times we're, and it, and it, and it worked out. Cause I, and I, and I just think, you know, you're, you're going to learn on the fly. There's nothing you can do to prepare. Um, it just, but it's probably more like this whole like street sense. Like I'm going to, we're going to figure it out. You know, we're not, I'm not going to give up easily, but to think that, oh, we're going to wait till the stars align perfectly and then take the plunge. Um, that's just foolhardy. You'll be waiting your whole life and then you'll be looking back and going, shoot, I wish I'd started this yesterday. There's a great Chinese proverb. I think that's like the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time, time to plant, plant a tree, tree is right, right now. now. Yeah, I love right? that. So when it comes to, okay, so, so you had a strike when the iron's hot because you see this window, um, but, you know, timing personally isn't probably right for you as we talked about. I mean, you guys are expecting, you have all this going on because there's this, you know, this fad word out there in the entrepreneur space of hustle. And I'm like, right. I don't, I, I think so many people fail because, you know, maybe, maybe they're just not passionate enough about what they do, but they're not willing to put in the work. I mean, you guys are out there fulfilling customers, doing work, and on the side, learning how to build websites and going to doctor appointments and all of this. Like, right. what was that grind like, dude? Because, I, I mean, I'm, I'm picturing this in my head. I'm like, where do you guys even sleep? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's which is awesome. I mean, this is like, I think because Stephanie and I met, um, for better or worse, through business, and we already had this tremendous work ethic um, that we frankly know no different. I mean, people like, I mean, we, we right now, it's the same gig. I mean, we live, eat, breathe, and sleep this business. That's what we talk about, probably drive our, drives our kids crazy. But what we, we always weave in the, you know, the life lessons and, and, and here's what, you know, here's what really goes on in the world. Um, but you know, sometimes, yeah, truthfully, the dinner table doubles as the boardroom table and, and you end up having kind of those tough conversations um, where I think we have, uh, you know, so, you know, so I think it, it's there is this sense where you're always on. Um, but to try to uh, have a, a degree of sanity, if you will, in that um, you need to carve out some white space. And for us, that uh, it sounds so dorky, but I mean, we, we initially um, came up with this idea around a New Year's, New Year's resolution called No Screen Sunday. And I'm talking like, not just like, oh, put your phone away or like, don't, don't check your email. I'm like, these things are like put away and like locked up in a safe. Like we're not touching these for the whole day, you know? And, and all it, you know, really that was, was created um, 
you know, uh, an entire day where we weren't, we couldn't even be kind of tempted or tricked or something buzzed and I got to know what it is. Um, and uh, we ended up spending more time outside with kids, we'd go for a walk, you do things you don't normally do. Um, and you just realize, you know what, the world doesn't, the world will continue on. You're not going to miss a whole bunch of things because you didn't obsessively check Instagram or the Twitter feed. It'll all be there. Um, but it just created a bit of white space for some, uh, fresh thinking recharge personally. Um, so every now and then we'll, we'll, we'll call one of those or, uh, you know, you know, I mean, or in a, or in a vacation kind of just leave that behind. Um, so you, uh, you know, it's, you know, the term in of itself is pretty overused, uh, but you know, I think you do need to balance both of those out. If you're working, go at it full, full bore. But, um, if you're not, then, then don't try to do both at the same time, for goodness sakes, like just let it, let it lie. Um, and if you've built a team, trust, trust your systems, trust the team of people that you've surrounded yourself with, um, to, to, to run, run with it, it. And, and they'll, and they'll, they'll do, do a great job. job. Yeah, I love it. And then sometimes, you know, when we force ourselves to detach, that's where those best ideas come up with, you know, because we're not in that reactive state. And it's like, you know, when you're in the woods or hiking or something, boom, those ahas can happen. So, Oh, for sure. Yeah, I love that, man. So, um, okay, so then, well, let me ask just one more question about this. Um, and then I kind of want to move more into the spaces that you guys are transitioning today. Yeah. Um, how important do you feel that your success has been um, – by picking something that obviously, I mean, you have a life obsession. It's probably more than a passion, a life obsession with what you do. Right. And so does your wife, you know, because it's like, I mean, the, the tough times are so tough that if you don't truly love it, you may not keep pushing. I mean, how important do you feel that that's been to your success for entrepreneurs? And do you feel that that's something entrepreneurs really need to think about before they jump into a space? Oh, yeah. I mean, take take the time to get that right. Um, there's a couple approaches that, that an entrepreneur, I mean, for, I agree, it's, it's pivotal because um, in those moments, and, and uh, frankly, I have them as much as anyone else. Um, and the question that I've personally been struggling with, uh, maybe for like the last six months, is is probably the most pivotal of all, which is why do we exist? Which is why do we exist as a company? Why is that we do? And really, that's answering kind of a vision statement, if you will. And and for us, it had historically really been about. Um, kind of the industry because that's where we had both come from and Stephanie and I were really focused on this particular industry. Um, and the right answer for, you know, everyone listening should be something just shy of to make the world a better place, right? I mean, that's what everyone's, oh, I'm here to make the world a better place. Well, how do you kind of phrase that and position that for your uh, particular niche market? Um, and so, it can, um, for us, and talking about getting that kind of flash of insight being away from uh, the computer uh, a little bit, I was I was literally just driving home the other day, and I'm like, the reason why we exist is to positively influence the world through the power of the human voice. So I didn't just say influence the world; we want to make a positive impact, and we have and and. It is done through the human voice. We don't do it through graphics. We don't do it through video. It's the talent on the platform. And it's the words that they're using to put out good messages in the world. It's what people hear on podcasts. It's what people hear in terms of instructional videos and product demonstrations and, um, you know, GPS systems. They're positively guiding somebody on how to, how to get somewhere important, maybe. So I just felt like that really kind of captured it for us. Um, and so I think that's the question when picking that niche market. Well, then, fa you know, fast forward a couple of years, are you going to be happy with that particular niche, that particular product? Why do you exist? And if it's because, oh, I saw somebody else having some success and do it, well, that is a terrible idea because, first of all, they've already got a head start on you. They, they, maybe they are passionate about it. Maybe it's their life obsession. So the best way to move forward on those kind of things is to look back and I call it the thread of your life. Like there's gonna be this one thread that's just stitched through everything. I mean, like there's pictures of me like banging pots and pans and I can, that's probably why I picked drums. Mom bought a piano, no one paid, played piano in the house for years. She just threw me into lessons one time and, and I picked it up. I learned all by hearing. I didn't, I was, you know, um, not great at reading music but I could definitely hear and pick it up. Then that going to a school that kind of, you know, and dad with the technology, like there's a thread 
that is weaved through everybody's life. And you got to just kind of draw upon those like moments of truth, those pivotal moments in your life, um, those kind of coming of age moments or something significant that happened and go, what was that around there? And are there similarities? And next thing you know, you, re you realize that this whole quilt of your life has been all stitched together with this one common element. And whatever that is, my opinion, that's the thing that you should be starting a company around. Yeah. Yeah, I love it, man. It's so powerful. It's, uh, um, you know, like I'm not a big reader of, of physical books because it just hurts my eyes, but I love to listen, you know, right? And, and when you look at like whoever is, is narrating that book on the audio, that makes or breaks that message. You know, oh, if, if you pick sure. the right voice with that right message, holy crap, is it powerful? And, oh, and yeah. it is. I mean, and sometimes I'm even at the point now where I'm just like, like I even like know some of the narrators or I, I know, like I'll buy an audio book. I'm like, I'm not so keen on the thing, but it's like, there's, there's gotta be something I'm going to learn from that. Um, I, I love that. Or, if, um, a lot of these kind of classics as well too. Um, you know, like think and grow rich is an example. It's like, there's like five different versions of that. I mean, find the one with the narrator that you like, because that's one that you can like. That book is awesome. That was another game changer for me. I mean, I, I probably listen to that two, three times a year. Um, I mean, I, I use all the storage on my, uh, some people take photos and I, I do take a lot of photos on my, uh, my, my iPhone, but I like, I load it all up with audiobooks, and that's all I do is just like, just cycle through those all the time. So, um, I think, uh, Brian Tracy calls it like the university on wheels, like listening to audio in the car kind of thing. I'm like, oh, it's the university in my pocket. I mean, that's, that's, that's how, how I listen, listen right? That's, that's how, how you learn. learn. Yep. No, I love it, man. So, so for you though, personally, is it difficult for you to get the knowledge out of the book because you're like so focused on you know the, the guy narrating or, or, or whatever i mean is is do you find that that kind of distracts you because you're you're almost learning from their narration uh, that they're yeah doing? um i mean at this it's you know i think i maybe i have more of an appreciation for it i mean you know if you're a photographer you know kind of a, a great shot for a whole bunch of reasons and you can and you can appreciate that um and it kind of hones your own skills um, but, uh, no, I don't, I, you know, I try to I listen to the message, um, and, um, you know, pause and rewind and re recap. Sometimes I know them, I know the book so well, I'm like, all right, chapter, chapter five is track 10. I'm just going to fast forward to that, you know, and just kind of get right to this piece that I really wanted a refresher on. Um, I, you know, there's, uh, there was a real, uh, real kind of, uh, you know, not, not to be a downer, but a real kind of discouraging stat about like how, you know, a lot of people buy audiobooks and particularly in CD form, and they like listen to the first two CDs and they kind of don't get through all the material. Um, but I mean, you know, if you're going to, if you have those times in the day, um, you got to decide, make those trade offs in life, right? I mean, are you going to spend it learning or are you just going to, you know, veg out and watch more reruns of uh, something on Netflix? Um, I'm, you probably, you know, in, in, uh, various folks that you met or Joshua, it's like everyone you, that, that is a somewhat successful in what they do, uh, are just like voracious readers. Like they just readers and listeners and just kind of constantly, constantly soaking, soaking up, up that information. information. You find that to be true? Yeah. It's like Jim Rohn's quote, you know, all leaders are readers and I've yet to meet right. one uber successful self-made person that isn't. Just a right. massive student. And what I love about audiobooks is, you know, when I'm reading a physical book, it's it's another task that I'm adding to my day. Audiobooks, I can do it while I'm driving, I can do it at the gym, sure. I can do it while I'm cleaning house or whatever that may be. It allows you to integrate on such a powerful front. So yeah, I love them. Plus you can uh, you know, if you get really good with your focus, you can bust that to two X speed and, and retain. <laughs> That's right. It's like speed listening. Um, and and uh, one of the other kind of odd phenomenon I find that, that occurs as well is like when I'm listening, um, I can go to a physical place, like pull in the driveway or drive past something, and I remember a lesson that I heard. Like it kind of anchors you in the physical world. Like I remember learning something when I passed here, and it just like brings it to top of mind again, um, which is just really, really strange. Like if I'm, you know, in the backyard playing with the kids, like I just, I remember this one, um, you know, pr particular stories that were even, even told on there, you know, watering the gardening or and doing gardening or something like that. I, I remember what I was listening to last time I was doing that. 
Um, so it, uh, it it finds a way to kind of uh, creep back into your life in, in a good way. Yeah, you know, I've never thought about that. I, I bet you, I mean, if you break it down, if you study that, the learning is probably so much more powerful and so you probably retain so much more. It's like acronyms. You know, right? Like people have acronyms to, to kind of chunk them together and learn more. And I, I right. yeah, I've never thought of it in that manner, but I, I, I guarantee you, if they research it and study, you probably learn and retain right. way more because of it. So I love that. So, so now you're in a lot of spaces, right? So it's not just music, it's not just book voiceover. I mean, you're doing a lot of different things. Um, you know, how did you, how did you expand in these other spaces? And then when do you know it's right to expand in a space? Because it is sometimes too easy to get spread too far out. You know, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, if anything, I think one of the things that we've, that we've gotten right is, um, is, is just staying focused. Uh, I call it laser light focused on the human voice. So that's, that's the commonality between everything. Um, and so uh, kind of current day, Voices.com uh, is a platform. You know, we call it a marketplace. Uh, as I said, it kind of connects the clients with mostly ad agencies, video production companies, a lot of uh, authors, book publishers, um, podcaster, somebody who wants something recorded, uh, and they would, you know, uh, sign up and kind of create a pro, uh, basically an account on the on the platform. But they're there for one reason. You know, we're not a social network; we're a utility. You're there to find, audition, and ultimately hire a professional voice voice actor. And so, on the flip side, so we have two hundred thousand people who've signed up as clients and 200,000 voice actors or voice talents, we kind of use that term interchangeably, voice talents from all around the world who speak over a hundred different languages. And they're the ones that are creating their profile. And they they would say, hey, I, can, I do voiceovers for TV, for radio, for podcasts. I do voiceovers for these short explainer videos or Kickstarter promotional videos or in an app or a game or whatever. And they actually upload sample recordings of their voice doing these demos. And the demos are like 30, 60 seconds. Think of them like a highlight reel in sports where it's just like tons of little cuts all together. And it's amazing that your ear can actually kind of follow that. They're just like five second clips, but they're, they're, they're tight and it's all together around a particular category, if you will, such as like radio commercials. And you're going to hear, you know, McDonald's, Hilton Hotels, American Airlines, and then, you know, Grand Tourism, or Tourism for the Grand Canyon or something like bah, 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 bah. And you'll know, hey, man, this, this, this guy represents my brand so well. He's like the audio ambassador for my brand. And um, so it's really the, when, when we're kind of like that we've gotten into all those spaces, it's really this kind of user generated uh, and, and user uh, enabled platform that says um, that they, they're the ones that do voices for all these subcategories. Now, where we did draw the line, though, is that we don't we haven't gotten into like other services. We do voice for there's 12 main, main categories. Um, and in other languages, but we're not, you know, we're not creating video. We're not doing animation. It's not like a, you know, an all encompassing kind of freelance, um, uh, site. Um, we just kind of found this one little slice of the world and just are going deep on that because the research we've done is about, you know, $4 billion market, um, that this kind of work that's being procured online. Uh, our, our, our big milestone we're working towards is a hundred million. So, I mean, we're still feeling like we've got like 1% of the market. It's like so small. We're like, shoot, every day is exciting. Cause we're just, we, you feel that we're making progress, winning new customers, bringing in more talent for languages that I've never heard of before. Clients are now doing projects that a few years ago, um, you know, might've been GPS was like a novel thing. And then it was apps. Now it's like artificial intelligence that they need like entire, practically the entire dictionary read out for these new AIs that they're creating. I mean, it's just like mind blowing stuff that they're creating, but the thread through all of that is I got to ask the team, are we positively influencing the world, right? Is, is it, are we staying true to that vision of impacting the world through the human voice? And that's where, you know, you got to have that like, you know, guiding star that just becomes the filter to say yes we need to continue to move in this direction or no that's not an opportunity for us regardless of how good of an opportunity it looks like you realize you're trading time for it you don't want to be trading time for it when you know you're so far along the one path you have chosen if you're seeing some success drive that one further you can get a lot further on something that's already working than than switching gears midstream for a maybe um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, that's how we think of things. And every entrepreneur I think has to have those questions, those filtering kind of questions 
am I consistent with that original vision? Um, am I, you know, are we, are, are we behaving in a way that was true to the values of why we started this thing in the first place? So ask yourself, what are, what are those questions um, that, uh, that serves that filter to be able to decide do you pursue an opportunity or not? Yeah, I love it. And it sounds like, I mean, with, with, with the platform that you have, before you bring anything on, you're, you're, you're waiting for the, the consumer to bring the demand to you instead oh, of trying sure. to guess, you know, and I see so many people like, oh, this is a great product because I think it's going to be great. They don't have that demand yet. Uh, yeah, and then and then you're then you're trying. I mean, I mean, so there's uh, there's one uh, I would say failure along the way. I was actually um, that I think speaks to that. Well, a couple actually, just to to give examples, we were going to try to get in rather than just doing the voice over. We we're going to try to get into um, the the jingles, like more of the singing as opposed to uh, just kind of reading a script. Uh, well. Voiceover, you can like mix. It's one track. It's the human voice, and then you mix in like stock music or something else. There's a ton of amazing stock music sites out there um, that you're not, you know, that that you know you find the right genre and so forth. Trying to do custom music like that, it was just, it was not economical. People would want it done for a couple hundred bucks. It's like, do you realize I got to compose this, then bring in all these ten musicians and compose this thing from scratch? way more complicated people hear these things in their head especially musical and if they're not musical themselves how do i you know how do we create a jingle and a music bed from scratch that was a that was a pretty big failure um another one more recently about kind of getting ahead of the you know trying to jump onto a technology maybe before it was ready for for mass adoption was google glass um i was actually the first canadian i was living in uh stephanie's amazing i mean she uh, she let me, um, uh, and in fact, encouraged me to, to live in Silicon Valley for a, a good number of months, um, part of an accelerator there for a brief time. And um, I was actually, I you know, at the time, Google put out the call for for applicants for Google Glass. So I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll do, you know, and it was like, you have to respond with a tweet. I don't know if you remember this whole thing, but in 140 characters, explain why you would be a good Google Glass explorer and you should be part of this beta program. And I think I said something along the lines of, you know, I'll do something incredible with, uh, you know, voice and Google Glass or sound in the sound in, and uh, Google Glass. And they liked it uh, and um, was the first Canadian to, to, to get glass and went down to New York to pick it up. You can only pick it up on, in San Francisco or in New York. Came back over the border. I was terrified to kind of go back over the border like because I wore him around and everyone was just like, what is with this guy? Like, you know, you, you look kind of like a Cyclops is, oh, oh, are you recording me and all this? And, you know. People had no idea, and so you spend so much time explaining this. And really, I didn't know what we were going to do with Google Glass. You know, there were, the software was was new. Um, the platform it was kind of an Android um, esque platform. Um, I mean, we we spent some time trying to kind of tinker with, but until like the actual, we can we produce voiceover recordings. We are not a distribution platform, and that's like you know you got to. Think of that. If you're like dealing any kind of web product, are you a producer or are you a distributor? And we realize that iTunes is an amazing distribution channel. Amazon, amazing. Um, Audible is a distribution channel. Uh, the app stores and so forth. YouTube, that's how it's just. But these platforms are distribution platforms. We are a platform for the production of the voice. And Glass kind of didn't really fit either one of those. I think we just kind of tinkered around with it for, uh, uh, frankly, out of curiosity more than anything else and uh, became just a bit of a distraction and realized this isn't, it's not on brand. It's not on mission. Um, it's time to let that go and, and uh, double, double down, down on the efforts of the stuff that is working. So when, when do you know, um, you know, because like in Seth Godin, you know, his, his brilliant book called The Dip, he talks about, you know, very successful people know when to quit. You know, right with within that dip. At what point? Because you know, I'm sure there's probably other things that have happened where, like, you've ventured into, but at some point, you know when to cut it out. And, and at what point, you know, do you do you guys do that? Do you recommend that? What should other entrepreneurs, if like, how long do you give something before it's like, look, we just got to give this to X? Because we're always trying new things, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, rather than just kind of going in blindly, I mean, I go in with an objective or some kind of milestone, a checkpoint, if you will. That's like, okay, what defines success, right? And uh, what defines success like six months from now or a year? Um, and uh, there was a recent initiative around here about getting so many, acquiring so many new users using a channel we've never tried before. Um, and uh, 
didn't work. We we're aiming at nearly, we we're aiming for a thousand new accounts, got 26 over a four month period. We're like, this is, there's promise. Maybe it could work um, in its current iteration. And we kind of tweak things a few times along the way trying. And we just have to, at the, at the, at the end of that, we just, and we said we would stop the end of our fiscal year and check in. Um, which was just a couple weeks ago, and we, and we realized, you know what, this is not the best use of our time and resources. Twenty six out of a, you know, out of a, a thousand is is not a good score, um, and we just didn't think we'd ever make up that that lost ground. So I think if you go into a project, um, if it's a new product development, we've come up with some other um, criteria to make these strategic decisions because strategy at its heart, uh, going back to again. Um, uh, well, actually, this is Michael Porter now, is a series of decisions. Strategic strategy is decisions uh, on trade-offs, right? You only have limited resources, and which are your, mostly your time and your money and your energy. So you got to decide what you are going to do and what you aren't going to do. Uh, and it's, it's a fork in the road. You cannot do both. Um, and so the way that we, we think about that now is, we will only can even consider doing something if it'll generate a hundred thousand dollars in revenue in the first year. That's like a very like pretty simple floor because um, you got to think like this thing's got to pay for itself basically. And as soon as we start like layering on, oh, it's going to require a development team of four people. Okay, well now it's got to be a half million in the first year for this new product line or feature or whatever it is. Otherwise, it's just not worth doing. It really isn't. Um, and you end up on your, you know, your financial statements with, you know, main revenue stream one, two, and three, and other. And it's this piddly little thing that you're just like, what, what is in that? I know it keeps saying other, and then we open it up. We're like, all oh, right, there's the five failed projects that kind of didn't go anywhere that just give this trickle of money. Yeah, we got to account for it somewhere. But it's like, so we've stopped doing that, right? Because it's real. Like we don't want to be spending any more time and and energy um, that way. And so I, I think go into any new initiative with some milestone of what you what define success early and a, and a time frame and if you can do that when you get to the time frame it forces you to make that that call at that point and go like hey if we were at five or six hundred um new accounts as i mentioned on, on a thousand well, i might have been willing to proceed but 26 out of a thousand no this isn't this isn't happening so i think you've got to um you got to go in with that definition and that will make the decision easier because if you wait and you're there six months down the line, you're gonna be so emotionally involved in it. You're like, oh, just a little bit further, just a little bit further. So the the numerical um, element just cuts the emotion away and you can know, you can kind of look yourself in the mirror and go, this was a success or not. And if it is, or it's close to it, you know, go for it. If it's not, let it go. And um, there'll always, always be another opportunity around the corner. corner. Yeah, I love it. I love setting up those like internal agreements or stop losses, if you will. It's like a, an easy analogy you might be going gambling, you know, mm -hmm. right? Because you get emotional once you get going. But if it's like, hey, I'm going to go gamble, and if I lose 300 bucks, then I'm done, or, or whatever. And then you got to follow those rules. Because, dude, when you get deep, you get emotionally attached, and it's easy if you don't have those rules in place, right. um, you know, to, to uh, not abide by them, right? So, exactly, exactly. So, okay, so you're, you're in, um, you know, so talk to us real quickly about it. I know you say that you got, you're really in 12 different spaces, and because and, we have yep. a lot of entrepreneurs in a lot of different spaces that are listening. So just to give them an idea of what those spaces are. For sure. Um, the, fir the first one, the biggest one that I think about uh, is, um, and most people think of this as like, oh, radio, um, radio and television voiceovers. But really, that is kind of like the traditional broadcasting of voiceover. Um, and that actually accounts for only about 10% of, uh, of the market. But some of the others, the other 90% is kind of all the non-broadcast things you're not necessarily going to hear on uh, on the you know classic radio and television. Um, things like as we covered already, audiobooks, um, cartoons or animation, documentaries. A lot of uh, you know individual publisher or uh, producers um, are creating documentaries. Sorry, I'm just zipping around here. Um, are creating documentaries on their own for their own passion project. Um, you know, educational content. We see a lot of universities now taking their curriculums and packaging them up onto some, you know, and creating digital equivalents of the textbook and in-person in lectures and packaging them up in audio 
for a distribution platform like iTunes U, right? There's iTunes got podcasting section and this might be a great tip. I mean, you got, you can listen to like Yale, Harvard, Stanford. You can go listen to all this, all these business, all the business classes are like there online. Um, you know, if you have the wherewithal, don't feel like you got to go drop a hundred grand on or 50 grand on, on tuition. It's the exact same material. Um, you know, any, really any, any kind of new media or internet, um, content, vid um, video games, movie trailers, uh, you know, podcasts, anything that you, I think I kind of covered off the 12. I mean, not anything that you hear the human voice fact is somebody still went into a studio, read a script and brought that to life, delivered some kind of audio file, a wave file, three, whatever. Um, and that's how a voiceover gets done. I don't think the technology, I mean, we've all heard it, um, the like text to speech where it's like, hello, Joshua, thank you for reaching me today. You know, today we will be learning about, you know, like no one wants to hear that. You know, obviously it's gotten a lot better, probably, you know, 10, 15 years away, like it would be indistinguishable, like whether it was recorded, um, or kind of stitched together, um, by kind of a computerized voice. But nowadays, um, the fact is somebody, somebody had to, you know, that client, creative producer had to go hire somebody um, and to, to get that script read. Um, and that is what we do is, is connect those connect those two parties together. Yeah, I love it. You know, so many, so many entrepreneurs are so afraid to go build out their digital presence online because they're, they're afraid of being on camera. And I'm like, you don't have to be. You know, right? You can go out there, have a video done the product, hire a brilliant company like yours that's going to explain the product. You can pick a voice that matches your energy and the culture of your company. Yeah. Uh, um, you know, when you have that on your website, like within two minutes, if you're not explaining why you exist, your story, how you solve consumers' problems, you're probably yeah. not going to get any revisits, you know? So, right. so I love what you guys are doing. That's why I, I said I'm so excited to have you on and, and something that all of you that are watching and listening right now, you know, definitely check out voices.com. Um, question though, with, with that, you know, I know you have those sections where you can go through all those voices um, but that can be overwhelming for some you know if I'm like hey man here's the project um, here, here here's the kind of person in my mind or the voice I have in my head do you guys have a service where then you'll just go do the research and match up and give some options totally yeah so um, yeah I appreciate you bringing that up um, there there is uh, you know the first there's kind of two paths right I mean ultimately at the end of the day you're gonna end up with this amazing brand voice for your for your company or your product um, the, the first one is kind of what we would almost refer to as like a self-serve approach, right? You can kind of, you can totally go do all of that on your own. Um, what you would get back though is probably, you know, when you got to develop a job posting, kind of describe who it is that you're looking for. And then what you would get back is probably somewhere between 50 and 100 auditions. Um, and our software is a matching algorithm we call voice match that finds the best people for you, invites them to the job. They audition and you can go through and listen to those. Now, if you don't think that, you know, if that sounds too much work, too complicated, or you want to have uh, somebody else kind of um, offload uh, to offload that onto you, um, I mean, there's a team of experts here. Uh, we call it account managers um, who've cast, if you will, voice casting is kind of like casting for a movie, um, who've cast literally like thousands. I think we're probably at about 40,000 projects at this point. Um, for like fortune 500 companies through to like the new startup, um, small business. Um, and they will kind of run that process for you. What you would, in, in what you would get instead of deciding between a hundred, you know, might go, okay, based on what everything you said, here are the five best you go through and listen and just pick that one person. Um, and then the deliverable ultimately is, as I say, that, that audio file or might be a collection of audio files for you that you can use however you see fit. Um, and so, yeah, absolutely. There's kind of that self service and then there's what we call professional services, which is almost like that, that full serve approach, um, which are very comparable in, in terms of, in terms of pricing. It's just really matters kind of how involved do you want to, do you want to be? And I think that's a pretty common model. You know, it's like if I were doing anything else online, um, you know, there's, uh, there's the do it yourself and then there's kind of this concierge service. Um, and so we found that to be um, tremendously successful here. In fact, it's our fastest growing part of the company. Um, there's about uh, 70 of people of the team um, that are engaged in that kind of uh, activity right now. So it's a big part of what we do. 
um, and uh, you know, hopefully, uh, you, you know, know those who are interested in the service, we encourage you to reach out. out. Yeah, I love that you offer that. You know, I've been like on sites like Audio Jungle trying to pick the intro music and you know, two hours into it now, I'm like, man, I'm more confused and lost than I was when I started this process because <laughs> there could be so many options. So I'd love to sure. do that. So a um, few last questions for you. I, I know we're getting short on time and you got to be jamming yeah. here. Um, so so for you personally, though, man, um, you know, because what we find in life so often is that good can become the worst enemy to greatness. You know, right. it's so easy to get caught up in this whole good enough thing. I mean, you could probably just be like, hey, look, we're, we're good where we're at. Let, let's just go kind of take the foot off the accelerator and just kind of chill and, and be comfortable for the rest of your life what keeps you personally man not accepting good enough but always striving for greatness and leveling up in this world i think it i think it starts with having that like really big um ambitious uh, vision of what you're tr actually trying to achieve um in kind of working through that uh through that process myself um, you know, asking Stephanie, uh, who, you know, we, we, we have, I guess, the, the opportunity to not only be kind of husband and wife and wrestle through issues that way, um, but also being co-founders as well. So um, I think we kind of sense the gravity of these, you know, why do we exist? How should we behave? What do we actually do that we do well? Um, those type of questions. Um, and that we can land on something that we both do feel great about. And I think if it's big enough, it's kind of always like, it's kind of like, you know, the analogy I often will give is like you're walking towards the sun set and because of the earth's rotation, you know, if you go kind of fast enough, you'll never quite get there, but it always stays beautiful out there ahead of you. Right. Uh, and so that's, you know, I think if you have something like that, that's just a little bit beyond your reach, um, you do aspire to that greatness. Just recognize you're never going to quite get there because you're probably so driven on your own to always be striving for more. Um, and when you reach a goal, you set a new one. I mean, we just finished an amazing year. It was a record breaking year on all fronts. Um, you know, uh, customer satisfaction scores, new customers acquired, sales, uh, and literally it was like, all right, awesome. Celebrated with the team just today, literally an hour ago, came back from what we call our rally, which is our all hands on deck kind of year kickoff. And it was, you know, you know, the, the long and the short of it was, we got to raise our game. You know, we're, we're looking to double again uh, this year. So how do you achieve 100% year over year growth and kind of just bringing various members of the team up and, and explaining actually how we're going to do this? Uh, and so I just, you know, I, I, I'm a huge fan of, of thinking big, um, not settling for sure. And if you're, if you're feeling like you're settling, I would think it's because you're probably feeling weighed down by all the stuff that you're doing. And so you can have this like, you know, my mom was a big gardener and she would, uh, you know, every fall she would go out and she'd like literally hatch it down these like grapevines to like nothing. I'd be like, you look like you're destroying the plant. And she's like, she'd, she'd explain, she's like, look, you can either have um, a grape, you know, vine that has really leafy and it's sprawling all over the place and really leafy. Uh, and that's what you're going to get because the energy is so spread out that it's going to go into creating leaves or you hack the thing down to just like the one core root and the one main vine and what you get are clusters of grapes. And so that's why you got to go through this process of like hack it down to the core, throw out the stuff that you don't need because it just looks pretty on the outside. Oh, it's so leafy. You go dig through that. There's no grapes to be found. So you got to decide you want leaves or grapes. And that's the kind of thing. If you're feeling weighed down, it's probably because you're doing too much stuff. And that's why you, you get the sense of like, oh, I think I'm good here. Well, you'll, you eliminate some things and suddenly your mind's open up of like, oh, wow, I've got all this more free time, free energy. I feel renewed. Now I can, you know, expect a season of fruit and a season of grace. Yeah, what a powerful analogy, man. I love that. So, um, so you're a dude that, um, you know, I mean, you, you've got a lot of energy. You know, you're able to stay focused. Um, you can tell by, by watching it here, again, your energy, your health levels. Do you have a, uh, some type of like a daily routine that you follow that helps you maintain that energy and puts you in the right state physically and mentally? Yeah, um, so that was been that was a big thing for me this year. Um, one, uh, I, I think you know I, I've always had a uh, 
physical journal, um, like a moleskin, like don't cheap out and buy some 99 cent thing. Like go buy a good 20 or $30 leather bound journal. Like you're just going to feel important having a great journal to write your notes in and you're putting your intellectual property into something. You're going to feel great about it being kind of the, the, the housing, the encasement for all your great ideas. I've always had a journal. I mean, look, I got to show you this. Um, so you guys understand what I'm talking about. I mean, this is like half of them. I mean, I've, I, I've like, that's just, like the whole thing is full of journals, right? So don't, don't mess around with that. Write all your ideas down. And part, one of the um, parts of that is um, the formula that I found is I always just uh, Sunday night, I, um, I think of things, and this is my mind, my wife calls it the b waffle brain. She, I, she's got spaghetti brain and everything's all connected. I'm like, I need little compartments. Waffle brain is how I think about that. So I just think in departments of the, uh, of the company. So it's like finance, HR, sales, marketing, customer service, technology, that, and then I, you know, I break that down and I bullet out, um, three or four things for each section. And that way, I don't find that I just went three weeks thinking about marketing and totally neglected the other sides and facets of the business. It's kind of like this big, you know, Canadian analogy here, the big snow plow, you're kind of moving everything forward and you don't realize that like, oh, you kind of some days it might feel like you're not making a lot of progress, but no, you, you touched everything. Everything got moved forward. It's not like something, you know, accelerated at the mercy of something else. No, you, you kind of moved everything forward incrementally. So I go through that um, Sunday night. If at, at the end, and I, you know, I might number the top three, if you will, to kind of stay focused. Like if there's one thing I got to get done today, that's what it is. And I write them in a way of like action items. I'm not just like, you know, financial statements. I don't say that or like, you know, acquire customers. It'll be, or I won't just put customers. Like, what does that mean? It's, it's just, it's written in a way that's like um, very action oriented of like who needs to do what by when. And uh, if there's a metric or something there, I, I get that in there. Now, if the, at the end of the week, there might be, you know, inevitably some things that I didn't get to. Um, I literally rewrite that same list then on the next page, or I might have some other notes in between on the, on the, on a fresh page, I rewrite and kind of carry forward all those things. Now, for whatever reason, I mean, that's me. I make sure I'm not looking. I, I kind of always have the one main page that I'm looking at. And if, if some stuff kind of drops off the list um, because or, or sorry, gets carried forward so many times, I realize it probably should be dropped off the list. It's, it becomes like non important. I just put a little X beside it. At least I know I made a decision on it and I don't continue to carry that thing forward. Or maybe it's not as relevant as it, as it once was. But by carrying forward, you know, writing a new list every time I make sure that I'm, I'm always moving the company in the, in the right direction. Um, so that's been my main tool to kind of personally stay organized. And then, um, you know, then some of those other kind of on the health front, um, you know, eat well, um, you know, doing, I've, you know, I started running a little bit this year, not that I was a huge fan of it, but, uh, the lady in HR or HR manager, she wants, she had this desire to start a run club. Um, and that got a bunch of people out and she, she had us sign all these pledge forms of like, you know, the goal, why are we joining run club? And she said, Oh, we're going to do this 10 K run, um, at the, at the end of the year. And so, uh, I said, I just wanted to finish the run. I want to enter and I want to finish the run. We started with, uh, I think two kilometers and we got everybody up to 10 K and, uh, last weekend, um, we did the 10 K run, which was, it was amazing. So, um, it was, it was tough I won't lie on that one, but you know, wrote the goal like there's a pattern here right you write the goal down write what you want to do um have that and kind of keep in front of your mind and uh, and work towards that so um those are some of the things that i do personally to uh, to stay organized and to make sure i keep those energy levels up as well too yeah i love it. you know my favorite abraham lincoln quote is if you gave me an axe in a tree in six hours to cut down the tree it's been the first four hours sharpening my axe and it just comes down to you know, the success and planning, which you're just talking about there. You're not going into any week uh, in a lackadaisical fashion. You have intention, you know, so I, I love yep. that, man. So, um, okay, something happens. Let's just say 
financially something happens and your company gets totally wiped out. You're good, your wife's good, kids are good, health's totally good, and now you've retained all this knowledge that you've learned over all the years of doing this. What are the first few things, knowing what you know now, that you would do um, and do differently immediately to go out there and rebuild? Um, I would, uh, it's going to sound, yes, I've never been asked that question before. Um, I'd probably start like a personal blog. I think I would just need like an outlet, um, blog or podcast or something. And the reason is it would provide me the mechanism to like start gathering ideas and maybe running, like floating some ideas out there. Um, maybe start to articulate kind of what I've learned in the past and like summarize it. Cause that, I mean, that that's why I feel like I've written all, I mean, I probably got like a hundred articles right there. I could start just transcribing those things into blog posts, but um, I, I, yeah, I'd, I'd just try to get a feel for the lay of the land, um, do lots of like, you know, maybe, you know, if, if, if a uh, company was white out and, you know, if I was, if, if I could afford to have maybe travel a little bit, do some people watching uh, in the sense of like, what a great way to figure out what people struggle with. Like just stand in an airport for goodness sakes, or like a bus station or like a subway stop and watch people fuss with their phones or like get, just try to interact with the world around them. I'm sure I would come up with an idea or ask around, you know, you know, to friends and family, what's the most frustrating thing that happened today? Um, whatever I kind of came up with for that idea, I'm sure I'd start another company. I don't, I don't think I know anything else to do in life is other than, um, you know, start, create, build, grow. That's, that's what happens. Yeah. I love it, man. One common thing, this whole interview that you, you know, you really keep going back to though is, is getting the demand that exists there to solve people's problems and, and doing that research and not just shooting from the hip, which, which right. I love, you know, so often people just shoot from the hip and it's. You know, I mean, they may be smart people, they may have great work ethic, but they just got the wrong idea, the wrong product. Right. And, you know, I love right. that. So, um, and the reason I always ask that question is because we have a lot of listeners right now that are in the corporate space, but they got this internal war and they're, they're listening right now because they, they want to break out and become an entrepreneur or some may maybe struggling right now and, and they're just trying to regather, regroup and see how to go out there and recreate. So, um, so I love it. So, you know, I created this podcast because I wanted to interview doers like yourself, you know, guys that are in the trenches, guys are that are in the trenches, um, building epic lives and businesses themselves, you know, because there's always quote unquote gurus out there and you find out a lot of them have never even done it themselves, you know, right? So a place for them to come learn and, and, and um, get inspired to get motivated. So with that being said, do you have any last words of inspiration, motivation you like to leave our listeners with so they can go out there and create the life they know they truly want and deserve like you've been able to do for yourself? Yeah, um, similarly, um, I, I think you know, I think it is about finding that life's passion. Um, you, you, you know, people, everyone has gifts, you know, they might be not the, like, not necessarily a skill, um, a great place where you can kind of start to see this be teased out a little bit. Um, and where I've really had my eyes open, um, were these personality assessments, um, that are like the big one, um, is, uh, the Myers-Briggs assessment, which is like these kind of 16 personality types. Um, probably learned about that way too late in life. Maybe had a hunch, um, if you will, cause I'm a real like systems thinker. Um, I like teaching and explaining that, um, to the, to the team. Um, now for you is going to be something totally different, right? And so there are, you know, I think take the time to do one of those, um, personality assessments, um, because they're, they're free online. You ask maybe, you know, answer maybe a hundred questions. And the, the, the output of that is it's going to start to steer you in a direction um, and probably surface something you didn't know about yourself, in which case you can use that as you go to make these decisions of finding something that you know about, that you love doing, that you can see yourself doing um, over the short term uh, and over the long term, then that, that's the path, um, that you should, uh, you should be pursuing. So, um, that was just be kind of one action item, um, that I think everyone should be able to afford to do, uh, in terms of setting aside some time, uh, and I encourage you to go do that and then uh, make some decisions and go, go, go make, make it happen. happen.
Yeah, love it. Powerful words. And to our listeners, I know we end every podcast with this, you guys, but information without implementation is truly just the start of delusion. Information is no longer power, right? It's taking the information that you learn, taking action on that creates power in your world. David shared so many amazing pieces of information, tactical for your business, for your life. I mean, there's so much knowledge dropped here. Take something that you learn. Don't wait. Take something. Take action on it right now so you can go out there and create that life you know you want and you deserve. And David, man, I, I really appreciate being I know how busy you are, man. This has been a massive honor. It's been an amazing interview, man. I've really enjoyed having you on the show and cool. picking your brain, dude. And uh, awesome. I can absolutely see why you're so successful and why you continue to grow, man. So I, I truly appreciate it. You got it. That's awesome. Hey, if uh, anyone wants to get in touch afterwards, um, just uh, connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn. It's just at David Cicerelli. Um, hopefully you can uh, make a connection in the show notes or um, uh, of the podcast here today. Um, but uh, always willing to accept. Just uh, make sure you mention that, uh, uh, that, we, uh, that we heard each other here. And uh, I'll do what I can to uh, to help you uh, be successful in whatever those pursuits are. Yep, love it. And you guys, as always, when you're watching and listening, they'll be all in the links below. So David's website, all his social, uh, so you can connect with him on social, all will cool. be below. So go click those right now, take action. And thank you guys again. We will see you next time.